we're back and we just finished talking about our periods of the zygote, embryo, and fetus. And so what else do we need to talk about in terms of pregnancy? We have to talk about how healthcare and pregnancy can have a marketed influence on our prenatal development. So when we talk about healthcare and pregnancy, it's important to understand that prenatal healthcare is essential and it's so good at being preventative and catching so many things that could otherwise be issues. For instance, you go to a care provider, whether it's a nurse practitioner, a doctor, a midwife, one of the things they should definitely take is your personal history because that can be very complex. Something they should always check throughout pregnancy is blood pressure. If the parent's blood pressure increases dramatically, that could be signs of a condition known as preeclampsia, which could be very risky and very dangerous for both the parent and the offspring. Another thing to consider is dental records. Something as simple as an infected tooth could lead to many pregnancy complications. We also want to check things like doing lots of urine tests and doing lots of blood tests throughout the pregnancy, just to screen for many possible complications. Of course, to really see how the offspring is doing, an ultrasound is one of the best ways to look at the brain and the stomach and the heart and the spine in terms of their development. We also want to make sure that there is room in the uterus and the uterus is expanding as we expect it to. So we take a lot of pelvic exams and we take a lot of uterus measures and you can actually measure the fundus or the top of the uterus and measure if it's where it should be as a way to determine if the fetus is growing at the expected rate. Because we also talked about genetics in this unit, it's important for us to talk about how genetic screening can be an essential part of prenatal health care. And so if somebody is pregnant and they think they or their partner might be at an elevated risk for carrying a recessive allele or carrying something that could be a genetic atypicality, there's lots of things we can do about it. One of the very earliest things we can do is genetic counseling. This could happen before a pregnancy even occurs. This is when one or both of the potential parents could get a simple blood test or a saliva swab to see if they're carrying any recessive or dominant alleles that could increase the chances of a genetic disorder in the offspring. Let's say both parents are carrying a recessive allele for something that could be fatal. Let's even say something like Tay-Sachs, which is always going to be fatal. Well, they can do something like in vitro fertilization. In vitro fertilization is when the ovum are harvested from the parent who ovulates and when there is a sperm provided by this parent who produces sperm and they are fertilized in the laboratory. Then the embryos are scrutinized and given DNA assessments and only the embryos that do not contain the fatal genetic disorder will be considered for implantation. And so this can help prevent a lot of harm. This can help prevent a lot of trauma from the family and making sure that their offspring are not going to have those fatal genetic conditions. So what happens if a pregnancy is already underway and the healthcare team or the parent becomes concerned about a genetic disorder? Well, there are two main possibilities. The first is amniocentesis. And this is where a little bit of amniotic fluid is sampled. And because there'll be a little bit of tissue from the fetus in the amniotic fluid, the, the, the DNA of that tissue can be tested. Now how we get the amniotic fluid, that can be done in a couple different ways, either via a syringe, using an ultrasound to guide the syringe, or it can be done uh, through the birth canal and going up through the vaginal canal. We can also take a chorionic villus sampling, and that is very similar to amniocentesis, but instead of sampling the amniotic sac, we're now sampling the placenta. And through sampling the placenta and then doing a DNA test on the tissue from the placenta, we can also determine if there's any genetic atypicalities. And finally, let's say none of that happens. Any baby born at a Canadian public hospital is automatically registered to undergo newborn screening. It's my understanding that parents have to actively opt out of the newborn screening. And so if they don't actively opt out, all, board, all babies born at Canadian public hospitals will get the heel of their foot kind of pricked and the blood will come out of it and they'll test that blood right away for up to 31 different genetic disorders. So that's one of the ways we help identify disorders, prevent disorders, and if there is disorders identified, we can initiate a treatment plan as soon as possible. Now, aside from genetics, what else could be something at risk for prenatal development? We need to talk about teratogens. Teratogens are those dangerous, scary influences that can really harm our prenatal development. It could be things that could lead to miscarriages or stillbirth, but it could also be things that could cause some physiological and psychological atypicalities. Now, teratogens are complex and two parents 
who are exposed to the same teratogens may have different outcomes. And that may have something to do with their parents' genotype as well as the offspring's genotype. Some people may be genetically more at risk and susceptible to teratogens than other people. We also know that dosage matters. A little bit of exposure or a lot of exposure will play out very differently. And finally, critical periods matter. Being exposed to a teratogen when you're two weeks pregnant or two months pregnant or eight months pregnant is going to have very different outcomes. So, so to understand this, it's important that most of the time we encourage pregnant parents to avoid teratogens altogether. And if there has to be exposure to teratogens, it should really be done in consultation with a primary health practitioner. So teratogens tend to be broken up into four major groups. We have diseases, drugs, chemicals, and other environmental hazards. So for diseases, what we want to be very clear on this, when we're talking about diseases, we're not talking about the common cold, and we're not talking about the common influenza, or even something like stomach flu or norovirus. That type of stuff can be harmful to the parent because their immune system is weakened, but doesn't tend to be too harmful to the offspring. Instead, diseases that are more harmful to the offspring tend to be in certain classifications. They tend to be things like a lot of sexually transmitted infections. We know things like HIV, syphilis, gonorrhea, and herpes tend to really and drastically impact the development and, and growth of an embryo and a fetus. We also know that some mosquito-borne diseases, such as Zika virus, can impact the development. And so Zika is well known for being led to a small brain growth and head growth in fetuses. Then there are some illnesses associated with the presence of bacteria, such as toxoplasmosis. Toxoplasmosis is the bacteria most often found in the litter or the fecal matter of pet cats. This is particularly if cats are outdoor cats, but sometimes can happen even with indoor cats. And so it's always recommended that a pregnant person doesn't change the litter box for a kitty. And if you find yourself uh, in this circumstance, you get to say to your friends and family, I'm not changing the litter box till after the pregnancy. Toxoplasmosis can cause a slight infection in a pregnant person that they're not even aware of, but it is so severe it can cause a miscarriage in the offspring. And then we have other things like salmonella and listeria, which tend to be more foodborne illnesses. And that's why it's more important to make sure food is cooked thoroughly. It's usually recommended to many Canadian pregnant parents to avoid things like raw fish or unpasteurized dairy or soft cheeses, just to make sure you're not getting that potential for listeria. Now, aside from diseases, it's important for us to talk about the role of both recreational and medicinal drugs. We know that when it comes to psychoactive recreational drugs, if they are strong enough and potent enough that the parent feels effects, they're strong enough and potent enough that the offspring feels effects. Everything the parent feels, the offspring feels in a heightened way. So if a parent is enjoying things like recreational cannabis or alcohol or nicotine through vaping or smoking, then they are definitely going to be impacting the development of their fetus. We know that the studies on cannabis and pregnancy are less clear because legalization of cannabis is still relatively new, but we are finding a clearer picture about how cannabis can impact fetal development. We know there's been a long history of mapping alcohol and fetal alcohol syndrome disorder, for instance, so that is something we have a much clearer historical story about. And we know that, for instance, things like smoking and nicotine, it can shrink and constrict the blood vessels in the parent, cutting off oxygen to the offspring. And offsprings that are exposed to a lot of nicotine in the womb are, tend to be born smaller and tend to be born earlier because of that lack of oxygen. Another recreational substance that's worth mentioning is caffeine. Caffeine is not as problematic as long as it's kept below 200 milligrams per day which equals about two cups of coffee if you pour it at home in your own coffee maker. Those triple espresso shots from your local coffee bar might be well over 200 milligrams. Now in terms of medicinal drugs, the conversation around this really started with the historical case around thalidomide. Thalidomide was a drug given to pregnant people to help calm nausea and morning sickness. And it settled their stomach right away and the parent didn't notice any malefacts. However, the presence of thalidomide around the embryonic development greatly suppressed the development of arms and legs. And babies that were born after their parent had ingested thalidomide in the womb, while they were in the womb tend to be born with what was known as flapper arms or little tiny flapper feet. Some individuals had uh, typically developed legs, but their arms would only go about to this distance. 
or they might have shortened legs and shortened feet. This was a huge crisis. We know of over 10,000 babies in Canada that were born with this condition. And because of that, more strict measures have gone into the testing of drugs for pregnant people. And so because of that, we've identified things that seem pretty safe and not psychoactive at all, like things like an aspirin pill. An aspirin pill seems pretty low key and is safe for the parent, but not safe for the offspring. We also noticed lots of things like some herbal remedies, things like a raspberry root tea, which didn't seem to have a big impact on the parent at all, could lead to miscarriage of the offspring. And finally, there's really life-saving medications out there like antidepressants and sedatives for anxiety. And although those are major and important for the parent, they could cause maleffects in the offspring. And so that's why it's important if somebody is experiencing, let's say, an addiction to a heavy recreational drug like narcotics or cocaine or alcohol, or if they're on a prescription medication for antidepressants or anxiety, it's important to talk to a primary care provider about this so you can navigate what is the best option moving forward because it's not good to take something away from the parent that is life-saving. For instance, if a person is completely at the brink of losing control and they know one glass of wine will help them, some doctors say that one glass of wine is the lesser evil. Some doctors say no. And it really depends on the individual person's characteristics and what's going on in their situation. So drugs are definitely a teratogen and it's definitely something to be careful of what you're ingesting if you are pregnant. Next up, we have the teratogens known as the chemicals. So this, we're really talking about things like pesticides or cleaning sprays or antibacterial wipes or things that are heavy in alcohol, like alcohol wipes. So those, because they're really good at killing little tiny bacteria and little tiny insects, they're also good at leading to miscarriage of an embryo or fetus. And so this comes into play if you are exposed to a lot of these chemicals in the workplace. If you deal with lots of heavy cleaning materials or you're in a manufacturing factory and there's lots of really heavy toxic things. We also know if there is a lot of heavy metals, for instance, lead or mercury. Mercury can be found in a lot of big fish like tuna, and it might not harm the parent, but it could harm the offspring. And lead could be a problem, especially if one's drinking pipes are made, still made of lead. The parent might not notice, but it could cause severe brain damage in the offspring. So it's definitely important to understand the risk that we take in when you're exposing yourself to certain potent chemicals in the environment. And finally, there's other types of environmental hazards, namely radiation, heat, and physical injury. By radiation, we're really talking about things like x-rays or sun radiation or the radiation you experience in a tanning bed. Tanning beds are not recommended for pregnant people. And it's important to note that every time the pregnant parent feels hot, the offspring is much more warm. And that's because they're inside wrapped in all the layers of body that the parent provides. So anytime the parent is feeling hot on a summer day or if they're in the sun or if they're doing really intense exercise or if they run the bath a bit warm, the offspring is going to feel a lot hotter. So because of that, they don't recommend pregnant people ever get into saunas or hot tubs or do hot yoga or put any heating pads right on their back or their stomach where their uterus is. It's important to always try and make sure that the offspring stays a comfortable temperature for them. And of course, we want to avoid anything that could lead to physical injury. Now, aside from teratogens, there are positive things that a parent can do in their lifestyle to help promote a healthy development of the offspring. And so a lot of people are concerned about the age of the parent. And this is true if a parent is really young, their pelvis may be underdeveloped and they might have a hard time carrying and birthing the offspring and they might not have as much financial or economic support. And if a parent's really old, it might increase their chances of more genetic atypicalities as chances for Down syndrome do increase after the age of 40. But by and large, age is usually pretty robust. The things that we can really do to promote a healthy pregnancy are things like staying active. There's lots of good exercise routines that don't involve getting really overheated in a hot yoga studio, such as things like walking, running, bicycling. It's important to understand that if you are capable of doing it before pregnancy, it's usually safe to continue on, at least for the first few months. Some things might have to go to the wayside, such as if you're boxing or wrestling or even things like contact sports, you might want to decrease that once you're pregnant. But many things can continue on until your stomach becomes large enough that your center of gravity is problematic. Bicycling is one that you might have to put away on the wayside once you get late enough into the pregnancy. And that's because while you're trying to stay balanced on a bike, the fetus can suddenly shift their weight to one side and could make you crash your bicycle. 
Aside from exercise, the other most important thing we can do to promote a healthy pregnancy is keeping stress levels low and getting lots of rest. Pregnancy causes fatigue, and it's very common for a pregnant parent to feel very guilty over being tired, but they shouldn't. They're gestating, they're growing another life form in their body, and it's very common for them trying to earn more money or getting the house ready and putting lots of stress on. Moderate level of stress is okay, but if there's a really high level of intense stress, very traumatic things happen during the pregnancy, stress can actually make our blood vessels uh, constrict and cut off oxygen supply to the offspring. This can lead to a similar outcome as smoking, for instance. We also want to make sure the parent stays hydrated. Anytime the parent feels thirsty, that means the offspring was already thirsty. And by the time you feel thirsty, it's usually too late. Very early on in the pregnancy, even at like three weeks gestational age, parents may experience intense thirst, where they feel like they're drowning three cups of water every hour. This is typical. The body is growing and putting on a lot of water weight early on in pregnancy, and that's totally normal. And finally, nutrition matters. Importantly, there's always gonna be some cravings that are hard to avoid, but when you can, it's always good to make sure you're eating lots of things with folic acid. This can come in the form of prenatal vitamins. It's also fortified in many cereals and grains products. Folic acid is super essential because way back in the very first stage of the embryo, when we were just a little neural tube, what helps and supports the neural tube development is folic acid. And not getting enough can lead to lots of atypicalities in terms of the closure of our spinal column. We also know lots of lean meats like fish and lots of foods with antioxidants like blueberries and lots of high fiber foods like spinach can really help. So healthy eating is really good. All right, we've covered the basics of pregnancy. What's left? Well, at the end of pregnancy, we have to give birth. And that's what we'll be doing next. <laughs>